Now we have here another one of these incidents, this miracle of feeding the 5,000, and out of it, why our Lord gives a discourse on the bread of life. That's the method that John uses. And he calls the miracles actually signs. They were given for a purpose. And John records just certain ones. You remember he said, many other signs truly did Jesus, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing you might have life through his name. Now, that's very important verse, those two verses, I should say, in John 20, 30, and 31, because they actually give the key to the entire gospel here. Now, we find him feeding the 5,000, and out of that grows his great discourse on the fact that he is the true bread of God. Now, let's get into this chapter, and at verse 1 of chapter 6, and I'm reading here. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. After these things. What things? Well, the things that were recorded back here in the fifth chapter. These are the things that he had left Jerusalem. He had come up uh, apparently on the east side of the Jordan River. Now he crosses over the Sea of Galilee, and he comes to the north section, apparently. And this took place, oh, about six months to a year after chapter 5. It was about one year before his crucifixion, by the way. And the way that this is dated is these feasts that John mentions. And as we said, John ties the gospel down to a calendar and to the geography, to a map, so that the one who came out of heaven's glory and the Word was made flesh and pitched his tent here among us, and he just happened to walk by the Sea of Galilee, and he went to Cana, and he went to Nazareth, he went to Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Jerusalem, and to Decapolis, and so on. And so we read here, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And verse 4 says, "In the Passover, a feast of the Jews was nigh. Now, apparently, he had been back in that land, that is Galilee, because he'd been down in Jerusalem. We saw in chapter 5, he'd gone in the Sheep Gate. Now we have here this time lapse, and after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Now we read, and a great multitude was following him. You notice the change uh, that I'm making in the tense of the verb. And a great multitude was following him because they were seeing his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. Now, this great multitude actually didn't believe in him in a saving way. They didn't trust him. What they were interested in, they were interested in his miracles, and they wanted to make him king there. You remember why? Because he was filling their tummies, and he won't become king of your tummy. He is the king and the Lord of our lives, our hearts. And so, as John had said at the very beginning in chapter 2, he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. And he didn't commit himself to that crowd back there at Jerusalem, and he's not even about to commit himself to this crowd that is gathering around now because they see the miracles that he did. Now, Jesus, we're told, went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now, the place that's pointed out over there is just no mountain at all. And actually, in that land, 3,000 feet is just about as high as they go, but they're very rugged. And I do not know whether the one they point out, but it is a very lovely spot and could well be the place where he fed the 5,000. It's near Capernaum, by the way.
Now we are told that what happened is he went up into the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. And when Jesus then lifted up his eyes, and he saw a great company was coming unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, Philip was the quiet one. He never had much to say. And our Lord was drawing him out at this particular time. And you'll find that Philip and Andrew seem to have gotten together. We find Andrew in verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him. You see, uh, Andrew and Philip evidently were quite active men, very busy, but they were not speakers. You don't hear either one of them. And yet Andrew's the one who brought Simon Peter's brother to the Lord, and you find that the Greeks came to Philip and Andrew and wanted to see Jesus. Philip got together with Andrew to find out what to do. And so we find them together here. And he asks Philip, he says, "'Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat?' Now, is our Lord asking for advice? May I say to you, he never asks for advice. Have you ever noticed that about his ministry? Well, why then did he ask Philip this? Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. He's just testing Philip. Now, Philip answered him. Philip looked over that crowd that was coming, 5,000 men besides women and children. I estimate it must have been 15,000. Friends, that's a pretty good-sized crowd, and especially for that land and in that day. And when Philip saw him coming, he's not thinking of a miracle at all. He says two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. Why, he says, even if we had two hundred penny worth of bread. Now, why did he light upon that fixed sum, two hundred denarii? What did he mean by that? Well, candidly, I think that's what they had in the treasure at that time. And probably Judas had made a treasurer's report that morning, and that's all they had. And Philip looked at the crowd and then thought of what they had in the treasurer's bag, and he says, why, 200 penny worth of bread's not sufficient for them. Now, one denarius is equal to about 16 to 20 cents. And anyway, you'd figure it'd be between 32 and 40 dollars. And friends, $32 to $40 just wouldn't feed 15,000 people. It just wouldn't do it all. Of course, the other gospel writers tell us that they advised the Lord Jesus. They wanted to be on the board of directors. You always find laymen trying to do that, you know, by giving advice on something they know nothing about. And they said, why don't you send the multitude away? Our Lord said, well... We're not going to send them away. We're going to have them sit down. We're going to feed them. And these men who had elected themselves on the board of directors, why, they found themselves waiters serving the crowd. And that's what they should have been doing all the time. And by the way, that leads me to say this, and I'm in a position to say it now. There are too many men today in the church that want positions. They want to have an office. And they want to be on the board of directors. They like to tell the preacher what to do, and they don't know. For instance, they don't have the information to begin with. And the second thing is, they don't have a spiritual discernment, but yet they want to say that. They don't realize they are the ones that ought to be out doing the work of the ministry. They ought to be out witnessing for the Lord. And they ought to be passing the bread, by the way, but they generally are not. And so here... Our Lord's drawing Philip out, and he says, Why, if we had what we've got here, we couldn't buy enough bread to feed them. And so one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, You see, Philip and Andrew are there together. He says, There's a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? And Andrew had been circulating around through the crowd, and he'd been making a survey. This matter of making surveys is important, I guess. The only thing is it never is very helpful. You see, Andrew and Philip were together, and Philip says, well, what we've got in the treasure won't feed them. 
And Andrew says, And all I found when I went through the crowd was a little lad there that had five barley loaves and two small fishes. Now, the five barley loaves are not barley loaves of Ms. Weber's bread. It's not a great big loaf of bread. They were like hamburger buns, you know, just to put the fish with. And the whole point was that this man, Andrew, that's all he could come up with. But he had to just sink right back down to hopeless despair. But he says, what are they among so many? Now, we find Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And I would call your attention to that 5,000 men plus women and children. And I think you could put a woman and one child with each man, and we'd come up with a reasonable estimate. And what you have there would be about 15,000. Now, the Lord Jesus is going to feed the crowd. He's going to feed this multitude. And here is something that is, I think, interesting now to note. You have 15,000 people, and that's a liability any time if you've got to feed them. And the only assets that you have are five loaves, two fishes, and also the 200 denarii between 32 and 40 dollars. Now, that's the only asset you have and liabilities of 15,000 people to feed. May I say, friends, many a committee would have handed in the report and said, there's nothing we can do about it. And again, the committees, someone has called a committee a group of people who individually can do nothing, but together they can decide nothing can be done. Our committee is a group of people who take down minutes and waste hours. And so here's the committee's report. We have 32 to 40 dollars. We have five loaves and two fishes. Well, we got 15,000 people to feed, and we're not any farther along. But you see, what you need in this equation, and here is what I call this the mathematics of a miracle, you need Jesus. And when you have him here, if you have the five loaves plus two fishes plus Jesus, you've got something, friends, and without him, why, you don't have anything at all. Jesus said, make the men sit down. And then they sat down. And someone has called attention to this. Mark emphasizes this part of it. They sat down in companies, we're told. And that is, each group of people that had come from a certain section wore a robe of a certain color, and they all sat down together. Everything our Lord did was done decently and in order. And each little group was color, and on the background was green. Have you ever seen an old-fashioned quilt? I have the opinion if you could have been on the hill on the other side from where these people were sitting down, you'd have seen something that had been quite beautiful, by the way. It had been very orderly because our Lord was doing it. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. We're told that when they were all filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remain over and above unto them that had eaten. Now, this is very important to see. I went to a liberal college, and I never shall forget how the professor explained this miracle away. What he said was that the disciples ahead of time had gathered together these loaves and fishes and had stored them up in a cave, and that the Lord Jesus just backed up to that cave, and then the disciples sort of slipped them out under his arm of a flowing robe, and it was sort of like hocus-pocus, acrocadabra, and he passed them out, you see. The only thing that's wrong with that explanation is it just won't work. That's the only thing in the world wrong with it. And you'd have to have more faith to believe that than to believe it just like it is, my friend. May I say to you, to begin with, 
Where in the world would you find a bakery in that area that could cook up that many loaves? And where in the world would you get that many fish for this particular occasion at this time? And we have no record that Andrew and Peter went fishing. This is utterly preposterous and ridiculous, as you can see. Explanation is that a miracle is performed here. And when you put Jesus in this and add him to the side of the assets, why, you have more than enough. In fact, you have 12 baskets of fragments. And that doesn't mean they were scraps. I used to think that a fellow would bite on a sandwich and he'd see a bigger one and he'd put that and down he'd bitten on, reach over and get the new sandwich, and that the fragments were these that had just been left over, that had been partially eaten. That's not true. That means that there were 12 baskets of sandwiches that wasn't even touched, my friend. And you know what that means? That means that crowd got all they wanted to eat. And people in that land and in that day went hungry. There were many people in the crowd there that day that for the first time in their lives had their tummies filled. You see, when the Lord Jesus does it, he does a good job of it. Now, will you notice verse 14? Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. You see, they're following him because he's a miracle worker. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And I think to get through that crowd, again, you have a miracle. In fact, I'm almost sure that you'd have to have a miracle for him to get free from the crowd. And the reason that he got free from them They wanted to make him a king. Well, someone says, isn't he a king? Yes. Didn't he come as a king? Yes. But that's not the route. He's coming to kingship. Friends, it's not a full stomach. It is an obedient heart. And those are the ones he'll rule over. Now, they're going to have a full stomach. I tell you, they'll want nothing. But that's not the route that he comes to kingship. Now will you notice, and when even was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was dark, and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. And I've dwelt on this before when we were in the gospel of Matthew, of how in that land that a storm will break. Up in those mountains that are around there, they're about 3,000 feet high. The Golan Heights are right above there that are in the news today. And so that storm will break then suddenly on the Sea of Galilee. And I tell you, this was a real storm. And we are told, so when they had rowed about 5 and 20 or 30 furlongs, that would put them out about halfway in the sea, by the way. They see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh to the ship, and they were afraid. Why? Well, because they didn't know. This is something they didn't recognize him at all. But he saith unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. The same professor that I referred to that explained the miracle of feeding the 5,000 away He explained this one away, too. He says, well, you see, John says, immediately the ship was at the land. Actually, he said Jesus was walking on the shore, and they thought that he was walking on water. Well, the thing about this is that it's not what it says, that he was out about this distance, which would put him about halfway in the sea of Galilee. And then these critics don't seem to understand the language of love immediately. The ship was at land. Why? Well, it was hard rowing that boat, and that storm was terrifying. But after Jesus got in the boat and the storm was quieted, it didn't take them long to get to the shore. That's the language of love, friends. And I'm afraid the critic doesn't know much about it. Now, we find that crowd were beginning to look for him. They were disappointed. 
And so we read it, verse 22, the day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there save that one wherein two his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. And they discovered that both the Lord Jesus and the disciples were gone. Howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias, nigh unto the place where they did eat bread, after that the Lord had given thanks. So they apparently had come up from the southern part of the Sea of Galilee, and he had then fed them there near Tiberias, and then they had come on by boat up to Capernaum. That seems to be the way that we have it here. We are told here, and this is the first time John uses the expression, after that the Lord had given thanks. And this is the first time he's called him Lord. As we've seen, the common word for him here is Jesus, because he's the Word made flesh. And what is that word? The word's Jesus, friends. You'll call his name Jesus. He'll save his people from their sins. Now, verse 24, "...when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. When they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? And they were wanting to know how he was able to get away as he did. When did you come here? Well, he doesn't really answer that question directly. He penetrated beneath the surface. What was their motive for seeking him? Notice now what he says to them. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves. It's a word that means fodder. You did eat of the fodder and were filled. Your only interest was that your tummy was filled. Now he says in verse 27, "...labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth and everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed." Well, here's what he's saying to them, if I may put it in our colloquialism today, and this is no translation, but just to bring out the meaning. Stop working for food that perishes, but work for food that endures for everlasting life. Which food the Son of Man will give you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. Now, you will recall, this is the same approach our Lord made to the woman at the well. Now, at that time, it was water, and here it's bread. And these are two things that are essential— Bread and water are very important to maintain life. And he is both bread and water. And if you notice, he takes these commonplace things. He's the Word. And how do you explain him? The Word became flesh. Now, what can we know about God? Well, the Lord Jesus said he's water, and he gives living water. And he's bread here. He's reaching down and touching us, communicating where we can understand it. We know what water is. We know what bread is. Now, will you notice what they said to him when he made this statement to him? Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? In other words, they want to do something to be saved. Man has always felt that if he could just work at it, he could be saved. And man feels thoroughly capable. He's able to work out his own salvation. He feels competent to do it, and he feels that God must accept his works. Now notice what the work of God is. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath said. Now this is the work of God. You see, the work of God is not that which is commanded by God, but it's that which has been wrought by God. In other words, it's what God has done and not what you do. It's the works of God and not the works of man. This is the work of God, that ye 
what? That you believe on him that he is sent. In other words, God provides food. He's the one that has provided that for us today. And we are to partake of it. The invitation he gave us to a banquet, to go out in the byways and highways. Tell them to come. They're invited. And it's a free meal, by the way, but it happens to be spiritual food. Now notice verse 30. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Now this, may I say, it reveals the hardness of the human heart. I can't think of anything. Here are the men that have been fed miraculously by our Lord when he fed the five thousand. Now they say, what dost thou work? Show us a sign. In other words, they did not want to believe at all. And they went right back to the dinner table. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And it wasn't a one-time deal. He fed them every day for 40 years. And so they go back to the dinner table. Moses gave us manna. Actually, Moses didn't give manna. God did that. And what he's saying here, that they wanted to be fed. You can see that's what they are after. They plunge right back to the dinner table. Our fathers did eat man in the desert, as it's written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, now notice this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Manna gave life in that day, but God gave it. But the true bread is what? For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Now, the manna gave physical life in the wilderness, but the Lord Jesus gives spiritual life. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Just like the woman at the well. Give me this water. And she's thinking of the water in the well because she said, so I won't have to come here and draw water anymore. She's thinking of physical water. It took our Lord quite a while to lift her thinking out of that well to the spiritual water. And it takes him a long time to get these folk away from the dinner table and get them to see the spiritual bread that gives spiritual life. Now, verse 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. He joins the two together. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. Christ, as the manna, is the one who came down from heaven, gave his life for the world, that we might have life. That's salvation. But we'll see that he's also the bread that we're to feed on constantly, that we might grow by that. After all, manna was miracle food. It was thrilling. And when they got into the land, they were given the old corn to eat. And that's the Word of God. And believe me, a lot of people don't like the old corn. And now will you notice, But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. You want bread? Well, I'm the bread of life. But you've seen me and you believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Now, friends, we've come here to a tremendous verse. They had rejected now the true bread. He says to them, you've seen me and you believe not. Now, in verse 37, and I want many of you folk to listen very carefully because there is an argument, a theological argument that rages today on election or free will. And there are some people who put all their eggs in the basket of election. There are others that put all their eggs in the basket of free will. Now, I'm not proposing to reconcile the two. I discovered I cannot. Now, if you had met me the year that I entered seminary, or the year I graduated, 
you would have got an answer, because at that time I had all the answers, and I could have given it to you. I have never been as smart as I was my first year in seminary and my last year in seminary. I just about knew it all then. And I could reconcile election and free will at that time. And I did. Oh, it was a marvelous explanation. And if I could think of what it was, now I'd tell you what it was, but I've even forgotten what it was. I think it was pretty silly if you want to know the truth. Election and free will. Well, we have them both in this verse. Listen to this. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. Now, that's a fact. That's a truth. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. That's election. But wait a minute. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Here's free will. Him that cometh to me. Friends, they're both true. I don't know how to reconcile, but they're both true. The Father giveth me, but you have to come. And the ones that come are the ones apparently the Father gives to him. But I think, frankly, as far as you and I are concerned, since we don't see into the machinery of heaven, and I do not know how God runs that computer of election. In fact, I don't understand computers at all. And that he presses the button, I'm sure he does. I don't understand it. But I do know this, that he's given you and me a free will, and we have to exercise it. And Spurgeon, you remember, put it, somebody said to Spurgeon, if I believe like you do, that is about election, I wouldn't preach like you do. Spurgeon preached whosoever will could come. That's the way I try to preach it, too. Whosoever will might come. And Spurgeon gave this answer. Why, he said, if the Lord had put a yellow streak up and down the backs of the elect, I'd go up and down the street lifting up shirt tails and finding out who had the yellow streak, and I'd give to them the gospel. But he said, you know, God didn't do it that way. He told me to preach the gospel to every creature, and whosoever will can come. So, him that cometh to me, he says here, I will in no wise cast out. And so, my friend, you can argue election all you want to, but you can come. And if you come, he'll not cast you out. Somebody says, you mean if I'm not the elect? Even if you're not the elect, but you will be the elect if you come. You can come also. My, how tremendous this is. Listen to him now in verse 38. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. How wonderful. The will of God is for you to come. That's the will of God for you. I know that. He says, I came down from heaven because the Son of Man must be lifted up. But you must be born again. And he came to do the Father's will in that. And it's the Father's will that you be born again. You'll have to come to him, friends. That's the only way. You'll have to come to the Lord Jesus by faith. Now, verse 39, And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Actually, this matter of predestination just refers to the saved. And all it means is what he says here, is that when a person accepts Christ, whom he justifies, he's going to glorify. When he starts out with a hundred sheep, he's going to come through with a hundred sheep. And that's all that that means. That's all I can get out of it. But I told you I had to stand on the fringe of things. Now listen to him in verse 41 here. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I'm the bread which came down from heaven. You see, he taught that he was God that he'd come down from heaven. May I say to you in this section here that he's teaching his virgin birth. Now, there are those that say the Lord Jesus never taught his virgin birth. What do you think he's saying here, friends? Verse 42, they understood it. Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? You know how he came down from heaven? through the virgin birth, as the angel told Mary, that holy thing is conceived of the Holy Spirit. This is something that needs to be added to the virgin birth. It's a complement 
or a counterpart of the virgin birth, this section right here, beginning with verse 38. For I came down from heaven. That's the Christmas story. Out of the ivory palaces into a world of woe. He came down from heaven's glory. He stepped down from the throne to ascend the cross for you and me. And he did it by way of the virgin birth. That's the Christmas story. And friends, there's no Christmas story without it. You can have the jingle of bells all you want to and a ho, ho, ho. But that's not Christmas. It's the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they got the message immediately. They said, why, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? But he's not the son of Joseph. Why, he says, we know his father and mother. They didn't, though. And how does he say, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. Actually, the word draw is drag. That's divine election. And I'll raise him up at the last day. You ask me to explain it? I can't explain it at all, friend. I just know that you have a free will and you can exercise it and God holds you responsible for it and you know you're responsible and you know right now you can come or not come. It's up to you. Verse 45, It is written in the prophets, And they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh to me. Now you will find Scripture after Scripture in the Old Testament that refers to this. I could give you, oh my, I can give you any number of scriptures. For instance, back in Isaiah, the 54th chapter and the 13th verse, and then in the 60th chapter, listen to this, verse 2 and 3. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to the light, and kings to the brightness of his coming. All these statements back there, that they will come to him, and you can come to him. These things are all made so wonderfully clear. And I suppose, well, I've got listed here at least a dozen scriptures that refer to this. For instance, in Malachi, the fourth chapter, verse 2, "...but unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall." Every man that listens to the Father and learns of him will come to me. That is the thing that he's saying, you see. If you listen to the Word of God, then you'll come to Christ. And that's where the great emphasis is being placed here, by the way. Now, the rest of this chapter is so important that we don't dare just run over it, but I must hit high points. Verse 46, "...not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father." And that's the Lord Jesus. "...verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life." And that, my friend is as clear as it possibly can be. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever." And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I'll give for the life of the world. In other words, he says that he came down to this earth, the Word is made flesh, and he's going to the cross to lay that human life down there as a sacrifice to pay for your sins and my sins. And friends, when you partake of that, when you accept that, then you are saved. And somebody says, ooh, that's so vivid and so strong. That's what they said in that day. The Jews thereof strove among themselves, saying, how can this man 
Give us this flesh to eat. And they were thinking of his literal flesh. Verse 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life. And I'll raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Now, friends, that is an amazing statement. And our Lord is preparing these men for that last supper and the institution of the Lord's Supper. And this is something that obviously is not to be taken literally because he was right there before them. And he is not saying for them to begin to eat him and to drink his blood. What he's saying is simply this, that he's going to give his life And under in the upper room, he made that very clear, that the blood is that symbol of life. The life of the flesh is in the blood. God had taught these people that from the very beginning when he called them out of the land of Egypt. And there at Mount Sinai, Moses had given them that great axiom that actually is medically true. The life of the flesh is in the blood. He's giving his life. He'll shed his blood upon the cross and give his life that by accepting and receiving him in a most intimate way. Now, this is the basis, of course, for the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And friends, there's been just as much disagreement among believers in the churches down through the ages over the interpretation of the Lord's Suppers that has been over baptism. I don't think they've fought over it quite as much, but there's been that disagreement. The statement, hoc es meum corpus, this is my body. They gave that to them in the upper room. That bread, that was his body. Now, there have been different emphases put on that. For instance, the Roman Catholic Church puts the emphasis upon hope. Hocus meum corpus, this, this is his body. And they say that they are able to transfer that bread into the flesh of Christ. Well, I don't think our Lord taught cannibalism in any form, shape, or fashion. And I think, of course, that is a wrong emphasis. And then there are those that have taken the position of the Lutheran church And that position is, this is my body. And that by, with, in, through the bread that you get the body of Christ. And again, may I say, I think that falls short of what our Lord really meant. And then there are those that take Zwingli's position. He was another one of the reformers. And he gave it a spiritual interpretation. That is, in this sense, it's just a symbol. It's just a religious ritual. And that's all it is. And he commanded us to go through with it. And so let's go through with it. May I say to you, I think that that is probably the interpretation that most of Protestantism gives to it today. And frankly, I feel that falls as far short of the interpretation of the Lord's Supper as the other two. What did our Lord really mean here? Hoc est meum corpus, and I would put the emphasis upon the est, because that is the place that, for instance, Calvin put the emphasis there, and the Reformed faith has always put the emphasis there, and the early church put the emphasis there. 
And that is that the bread is bread, and it always will be bread. It can't be changed. And the wine is always just what it is. There's no miracle that takes place there. And that you don't get the body through going through the ritual. And it's more than just a ritual. But there actually is a spiritual blessing that is there. I had a seminary professor that taught his boys that in the Lord's Supper, it's bread in your mouth, but Christ in your heart. And friends, I believe that there is a spiritual blessing that comes in observing the Lord's Supper. I think that he ministers to you spiritually through our obedience in observing the Lord's Supper. And there's no such thing as a hocus-pocus there. And it's not just an idle ritual that we go through, but it's meaningful and it has a spiritual blessing for the heart. And I think that's what our Lord is saying to them here. An intimate, real relationship with Him is the thing that is important. That as you ate that manna in the wilderness, well, that was temporary. I have something that's eternal, and that is life through what He brings. For we are told at the beginning of this gospel, in Him was life, and the life was the light of man. Now, this took place up there in Galilee, in, in Capernaum, because in verse 59 it says this, "...these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum." Now, notice the reaction to that. And believe me, there was a reaction here. We have the reaction of several groups here. "...many therefore of his disciples..." When they had heard this said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? In other words, there was quite a difference of opinion here at the very beginning. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What? And if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. Now, you're not going to eat me literally. I'm going back to heaven. But notice what he says. It's the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So that, friends, obviously, he's not talking about his literal body. It's when you and I, by faith, appropriate, I've always made it a habit at the Lord's Supper, especially when I taste the drink. It's generally grape juice and it's sweet. And I always taste it because it's sweet. And he bore the bitter cup for me on the cross that I might have this sweet cup. And that sweet cup is to remind me that he shed his blood for me. And there's a spiritual blessing there. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And in my entire ministry, I've always, during the Lord's Supper, read from the Word of God. And that has been a practice. And I find out that the Word of God ministers to the hearts of people. Why? Because the words of the Lord Jesus, they are spirit and they are life. Now, verse 64, "...but there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believe not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man come unto me except it were given unto him of the Father." But you remember now, you have to put with that, "...whosoever will may come." It's up to you, you see. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Now, you can see that in the group there that day, there were the hostile leaders that were there, uh, the religious leaders. There were his disciples, and there were the twelve, and in the twelve was Judas. So, you actually have four opinions concerning him at this time. Now, many of these disciples, not the twelve, 
But many of the disciples turned and went back. Now will you notice verse 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And this is a marvelous statement on the part of Simon Peter. He's speaking to the others. And that, my friend, is a very good question today. And it may be that I'm speaking, and I know that we do many times, to those that are not believers. Now, you say that the Lord Jesus is not to you a Savior, and that he doesn't meet your needs at all. I have a question. Where are you going? (laughs) I saw a bunch of young people on the island of Maui out in the Hawaiian Islands with a picture of Krishna up in front of them, and they were going over a monotonous song. Poor little folk there. They weren't finding any satisfaction in that. What disillusionment is coming to so many today? And there are those that are turning in every direction for life they're trying to find. I have a question to ask you. It's the question of Simon Peter. To whom shall you go? The Lord Jesus is the one, the only one, that has the words of eternal life. And now listen to him in verse 69. And we believe and assure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Here again is the testimony of this man, Simon Peter. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you is a demon. He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Now, this is something that is quite remarkable here and something that you need to note. I'm of the opinion that this man, Judas Iscariot, is a great mystery. Here our Lord lumbers him with the twelve, and yet he says he had chosen him, and yet he was a demon, demon-possessed, the man that is to deny. But I think all the way through, our Lord gave him every opportunity to make a decision for him. It's difficult to interpret evil like this, friends, It's one of the mysteries. Evil is always a mystery. That's one of the things that makes it attractive. Suppose right now I would say to you that I have a stick, two sticks. One stick is perfectly straight. It's a ruler. Can you imagine how that ruler looks? I'm sure that every one of you right now is thinking the same thing. Why? Because it can be straight only one way. Then suppose I say I'm also holding in my hand a crooked stick. And I'm of the opinion that if each one of you draw a picture of how you think that stick is crooked, that literally the thousands of you today listening would draw it differently because it can be crooked a million different ways. You see, evil has a mystery to it. And I must confess, this man Judas is carried walks the cross, the page of Scripture, it's difficult to interpret him. And our Lord says this strange thing about him. Now, that brings us to chapter 7 now, here in the Gospel of John. And we read here in the first verse of chapter 7, after these things. And I want to stop there for just a moment. After these things, what does he mean by that? Well, after the things that had taken place in the last chapter, and what John actually does in this first verse here, he summarizes what's gone before. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought the killing. Now, we believe that what took place here was at least six months after what had happened in the last chapter. Or let me put it like this. The events of John 7 transpired at least 
six months after the close of chapter 6. And the events of chapter 7 took place about six months before the cross. Now, that may sound just a little complicated, but it enables us to pinpoint down this event that's taking place. You see, we are now coming to the close of the earthly ministry of our Lord. And during the last year of his ministry, he confined his activities to Galilee. It says that he walked no longer in Judea because the religious rulers there sought to kill him. And he's not forcing the issue at all. This first verse is quite a revelation. You see, a storm was gathering about the person of Christ. And six months later, it broke in all of its fury upon the cross. And friends, it's still going on. There's more difference of opinion about him than any person that's ever lived. And he's controversial today. I tell you, they blaspheme him today and are saying the worst things I think that have ever been said about him. He's controversial. <laughs> May I say... About him, you see, there was this storm that was gathering. Now, it was at this time that our Lord abandoned his method of staying away from Jerusalem, and he went up. But note the way that it came about. It was at the Feast of Tabernacles, verse 2, and let me read it. Now, the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles is given back in Leviticus. We've talked about this before. It was the feast that celebrated their coming out of the land of Egypt and dwelling in the wilderness in tents. And that's what it's Feast of Tents. After they got in the land, they celebrated this feast by making booths. They all came in campers, you see, in that day the type of campers they had then, they all camped out, made these booths. And it was a joyful feast. It was one of the most joyful feasts. And that was the blowing of trumpets. And 70 bullocks were offered. And then there was the pouring out of the water from Siloam. And we'll see that our Lord went in the temple at that particular time, and that's when he spoke of himself again as the water of life. If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. You see, they did that and had done it at this feast to commemorate the water that had come from the rock. When Moses, you remember, smote the rock and the water flowed. And so they poured out literally just barrels of water that they got down from the pool of Siloam, and they just poured it out in the temple, and it commemorated water from the rock. You remember that Paul says, and the rock that followed them was Christ. He was the rock. And he says now that if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. If you want real water, why well, come to him. That will slack the thirst of the soul. And then they also illuminated the inner court. Oh, they had a regular torch parade and a pillar of fire. It was what they were commemorating. You remember, it was a pillar of fire that followed them by night. And so you'll find out in the next chapter, chapter 8, our Lord gives the discourse on the fact that he's the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So that pillar of cloud and that pillar of fire that led the children of Israel, why, is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have that here. Now, the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. Now, notice how he went up. His brethren, now this is brethren here now, are not his disciples, they're his apostles. These brethren that are here are those that are his half-brothers, by the way. Back in Matthew, the 13th chapter, the names were given to us. James and Joseph and Simon and Judas. You see, Mary had other children besides Jesus. They were his half-brothers. Now, James wrote the epistle of James, and Judas 
His half-brother is the one who wrote the epistle of Jude. They don't mention it. Now his brethren at this time didn't believe in him. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. They didn't believe in him, but they saw the fact that he had a great following. And so they give advice that he can't use at all. And he's not going to use their advice. They are his brethren according to the flesh. They had an undue solicitude for God, as someone has said. Now, will you notice verse 4 I'm reading? For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. You see, this is the wisdom of the world. He never took advice. Have you ever noticed that? Even these half-brothers, he's not following. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Verse 5. That's important to know. It's a sad state, but they did not at this time believe in him at all. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet. And the important word here is yet. My time is not yet come. Why? Well, he happens to be following a schedule, and it's his father's schedule. Now, verse 7, "...the world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify it that the works thereof are evil." The world is hostile to Christ. And the reason for that is that the Lord Jesus Christ, as we're going to see later, is the light of the world. And he turned on the light. And light reveals that which is wrong and reveals sin. And he condemns sin. I think it's the reason for the hatred of him today. He condemns sin by his very presence. And that hostility is that which must be broken down because he went to the cross for the love of the world, redeeming love. And that is what has broken the heart of hostile man. For instance, you see it in the life of Saul of Tarsus. He was breathing out threatenings. He hated the Lord Jesus. And then when he came to know him as his Savior, it broke his heart. He could say, he loved me, and he gave himself for me. And so he makes it very clear. And he says to his brethren, Go ye up unto the feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. Now he was going up, but not with them, and at the time that they went up. And so we find out that, verse 9, when he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brothers were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. The thing is that I think this bears out what we said back in chapter 5 when he went in at the sheep gate. I believe he always entered that sheep gate until the time of the triumphal entry. He always went up in secret, you see. But at the triumphal entry, why he appeared publicly and offered himself and demanded, actually, he demanded that they either accept or reject him. Now in verse 11, Then the religious rulers sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? They were looking for him, you see. And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him, for some said, He's a good man. Others said, Nay, but he deceiveth the people. So you see, even in his day, there was quite a bit of division and discussion concerning him. Now, verse 13, "...howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews." All of this was done rather secretly because of the fact that it would be quite obvious that anyone would be attacked for making any statement that would be Uh, inclined in his favor, and they'd be actually in danger of arrest. 
now we find in verse 14. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. Quite suddenly, he appeared in the temple. And this Feast of Tabernacles in the calendar of God, it sets before us the coming of Christ again to the earth and the events and stages which lead up to it. But this feast speaks of the consummation of all things. He'll appear suddenly. The Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. And I think he was carrying that out here at this time because that feast is yet to find its fulfillment in his return to there. So he appears suddenly. And the religious rulers marvel, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Their whole thought was that no formal training in the rabbinical schools. And they marveled that he could speak as he did speak. And that was what the enemy brought back. Never man spake as this man spake. Now Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. In other words, to reject the message of Jesus is to reject God's message. And he, in chapter 4 and chapter 5 previously, has insisted upon that. To reject him is to reject God. Don't tell me now that he didn't make himself equal with God. Now, you may reject that, but don't say the Bible teaches it doesn't. The Bible teaches that he made himself equal with God. Now, notice what he says in verse 17. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. If anyone is willing to do, is the way Weymouth translates it. In other words, if anyone chooses or purposes, and in the Old Testament, the invitation had been, taste of the Lord and see if it's good. And there's an old bromide today. The proof of the pudding is in the eating of it. And God says, you come so that what you have here are these steps. And this is the laboratory test that he gives. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. There must be this attitude of a love for the Word of God. Someone has said that human knowledge must be known to be loved, but divine knowledge must be loved to be understood. So we have here, I think, these steps. You have knowledge and love and obedience. This is the test. This is what he asks you to do. It's easy to sit on the sidelines today and be a Monday morning quarterback and tell others how it should have been done or to speak your mind without really knowing. He says, you taste of the law. If any man will do his will, you will know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. That's the wonder of the Word of God. If you're willing, friends, God will make it real to you. Now, verse 18, He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. The question is, do men want to hear God? And if they do, God will speak to them in his word. If they don't, that's the reason that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness unto him. Some read the Bible, get nothing out of it, of course. And that's the way God said it would be. Verse 19, "...did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law." Now, anybody that says today that they can keep the law, here are a group of people living in ideal conditions in a land that the law was slanted for, and our Lord said to them categorically, None of you keepeth the law. Why go ye about to kill me? It's the hypocrisy of those who are legalistic. And there's a great deal of that today, of uh, this hypocrisy that says, A sermon on the mount is my religion, or I live by the Ten Commandments. Of course you don't. The Lord Jesus said, None of you keepeth the law. Who are you trying to kid? The law is a mirror. 
and let you see that you're a lost sinner. The law is important. You don't kick the law out the door. That's the will of God. But the law lets you know that you're a sinner and that you need a Savior. It's our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Verse 20, "...the people answered and said, Thou hast a demon who goeth about to kill thee." They didn't realize that there was a plot underneath to put him to death. Now in verse 21, Jesus answered and said unto them, I've done one work, and ye all marvel. That was the impotent man at the pool of Bethesda. Then verse 22, Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it's of Moses, but of the fathers. You see, it circumcision went back to Abraham. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. Circumcision, you see, is older than the Mosaic law. And therefore, they would perform this rite. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, or ye anger at me, because I've made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. In other words, don't make a superficial judgment. And that's the difficulty with most of us today, and including the speaker. We make so many judgments that are superficial. We don't have all the facts. Now, will you notice? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the Christ? And so there was... Again, this division concerning who he was. And he's come now suddenly to the temple, you see. Again, let me read this. How be it, verse 27, We know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am. And I'm not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. Verse 28, I think this is rather oratorical. He says, all right, so ye know me, but I haven't come of myself. The one has sent me. And then he goes on in verse 29 and says, but I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And this is quite an interesting statement. You see, they were anxious to take him, but they can't touch him until his hour has come. Now we are told many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? In other words, even at this time, many believed on him. Many trusted him. Many came to him. And many rested upon him. Now let me keep reading. The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am thither ye cannot come. Our Lord said, You will take me at the proper time, not until then. But then I'll leave you that the resurrection and the ascension never be able to touch him again. Have you ever noticed after his death on the cross, nothing but loving hands touched him? And actually nothing but loving eyes saw him. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. Then said the religious rulers among themselves, Whither will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this that he said, Ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am thither ye cannot come. Now we come to this most interesting incident, and this is tremendous. I stand on the fringe of this, and I tell you, that I would rather stand here than stand in that inn in Bethlehem, because this is the one that gives this invitation. Listen to him. Verse 37, In the last day, 
that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. You see, it was on that day in the Feast of Tabernacles that they poured out all that water. Now he says here, as he stood, and I think that he could have been standing ankle deep in water when he gave this. They went down to the pool of Siloam and brought it up by the barrel foot. You see, they're celebrating in the Feast of Tabernacles their trek across the wilderness. And it's then that God had given them water from the rock. And this they're celebrating. Now our Lord says, Moses not only didn't give you the true manna from heaven, but he didn't give you the really the real water, that water from the rock. And Paul says that rock that followed them was Christ. And he's the one that gives the real water. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And here's free will, friends. And here's free will with a vengeance. If any man. That means you, oh, on this day, friends, any man, here's a gift God's offered you. But wait just a minute. That's free will. But here's election. If any man thirsts, it's the man that's thirsty. Oh, you go by and see a sign up, and it advertises a certain bottled drink. And on it has a picture of that bottled drink, and it has just one word, thirsty, question mark. And if you're thirsty, you'll drive in the next filling station and get your bottle of this drink. My friend, if you're not thirsty, you go on down the road. Our Lord says, if any man thirsts. But any man, if you're thirsty today and you're tired of drinking at the mud holes in this world today and find they're not satisfied, then get to Jesus. You can get to him today. If any man thirsts, you're thirsty, come unto me. And drink, and you can come unto him and receive him as your Savior. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given. You see, the Holy Spirit did not come until the day of Pentecost to form the body of believers and to indwell believers. You see, he couldn't come until Jesus was glorified. And when the Holy Spirit got here on Pentecost, it means Jesus had got back up yonder to the Father's throne. Now we read in verse 40, Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Some, you see, believed and turned to him. Some drank, and they were satisfied. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Some didn't believe. Same thing today. Hath not the Scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? And that's where he'd been, friends. That's where he touched down at this earth. Splash down for him was in that miserable little stable back of a miserable little inn in that miserable little town of Bethlehem. That's where he came. It's not that pretty picture that you see on Christmas cards. He came, began at Bethlehem. But you see, you don't stay there. These people had to go back to Bethlehem. But he had begun there. But now he is the one that's given an invitation to them to come and drink, and they put up this objection. So there was a division among the people because of him. Always has been, always will be, until he comes to reign. Verse 44, And some of them that would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. This is miraculous. They couldn't touch him at this time. Why? His hour had not yet come. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? The officers answered, Listen to this. Never man spake like this man. He was the great teacher. But he doesn't save you by his teaching. He saves you by his death and resurrection. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. But notice there's another man there, and he's one of them. And notice what he says. Nicodemus, oh, we already have seen him. He came to Jesus by night. 
And I think that's the night Nicodemus trusted him. Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, he belonged to the Pharisees, and he defends Jesus. Doth our Lord judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? And that was a joke, you see, to be from up there. It was a disgrace. It'd be like coming from the country. Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And that, of course, they knew the Scripture. But he hadn't come out of Galilee. He actually hadn't come out of Bethlehem. He'd come out of glory. Unto us a child is born, but unto us a son is given. The son came out of heaven, and every man went unto his own house. But it's wonderful, friends, to get out the good news that he's come to this world. And by the way, why don't you right now call a friend and ask them to listen to the message tomorrow?